Thanks, Andreas. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to start uh, our uh, session that is focused uh, on people, right? So we discussed a lot yesterday about our careers and about uh, uh, how should we uh, manage our own expectations as imaging scientists. And uh, we decided to, to uh, promote this session, to, to make a session with uh, some Latin American colleagues telling their stories about their, their careers, their trajectory, uh, both uh, in institutions in uh, Latin America, as well as their experiences uh, uh, abroad. Uh, so it's a pleasure to uh, start this session with Mariana Diniz from Stud Pasteur uh, in Paris, in France. And Mariana, uh, she's she's going to talk about uh, a little bit about her, herself. But uh, I, I'd like to to stress that she's uh, she has been uh, very important for uh, Labi. So she uh, um, did an interview with uh, Chris with. Uh, um, uh, Lionel and, and Andres, and this helped a lot to to promote Labi and uh, and Latin American uh, scientists, especially young scientists. So she, I think she she's going to talk a little bit about what she's she has been doing. So Mariana, please. Andres and Lionel and Hilary for the invitation to to be here. I'm very excited. Um, so yeah, to, I mean, I, I won't talk too much about myself, but I, I've been asked a couple of times in the interviews if what I do is scientific journalism, and this is really a hobby. What I, I've been doing in my career is mostly parasitology. Uh, first, I started with malaria uh, during my well, since my bachelor's and up to up to my uh, first postdoc, and uh, in the institutions that you can see at the top on the malaria life cycle and i was very lucky to be funded by these international organizations and then later on i moved to study trypanosoma which if you know it it's also a very exciting parasite so all of this uh, based on microscopy so that's what the little guy on the corner was supposed to mean um so yeah that's what i do it's mostly imaging as well um so it it has been the implementation of techniques to study mostly in vivo, so intravital microscopy, optical projection tomography, photoacoustic imaging, uh, and, and lattice light sheet microscopy. But um, really what I wanted to present today, and this is the introduction to, to people, is uh, at some point I thought, okay, um, maybe we should expand who knows us and how much we can reach in the global imaging community. And I, I had been working for, in, in, I don't know if you are familiar with Prelight, which is part of the company of biologists as well. And I became aware of focal plane. And then I asked them because I was linked to some of them because of Prelight to some of my colleagues. Um, they told me, yeah, of course you can, you can write your blog if you're interested. And so I started the blog on Latin American microscopists. Right now, if you see the map of Latin America, this is where we are. So. Uh, we have completed 10 interviews, so that was the initial um, plan to do 10, and the, the plan is to later, once we finish with all the countries, we go back and continue doing this continuously. Uh, so right now we are we are in starting in Chile. We have finished. At, I've been I finished doing the interviews in Argentina, but they haven't all been published, so it's still coming out. So the, the goal is to have uh, the interviews, at least initially, of all 33 countries, so around 400 interviews. And because the only condition they told me at Focal Plane was, please keep it to one interview per week. Uh, so this is going to last five years initially, and then we will continue with the updates for, for later. And so initially I thought, okay, it's about knowing the people and, and really putting everyone on the map on what is being done in the region. But as I as I started talking to 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 everyone, I realized, wow, there's a lot more of rich things coming out from these interviews, and I think we should we should know uh, each other in this sense. So these are, for example, so on the on the dark part, you can see some of the questions that I ask, and the the type of information it's giving us is who are the people behind the science that we see in papers, right? How do they reach this point? How do they get inspired to be scientists? Uh, also, I think this our role models for, for these and the new generations. So knowing the stories of others is really important for, for anyone that is already a young scientist and starting or considering becoming a scientist. Um, 
also highlighting the high quality and science done in the region, both within Latin America and by Latin Americans abroad. I think that that has also been quite um, quite shocking to me to know. Okay, we we all of this is available everywhere, right? In 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 the region and from Latin Americans elsewhere. And the other thing is the the very rich um, stories that people have been sharing of uh, the historical and political aspects of the country, which I think when it reaches a global audience, some people are not familiar with these challenges. So, for example, some of the things people mentioned were. Uh, how it was post-dictatorial in some of the countries, right? Or the political instability, or even when I've interviewed, I didn't know that we are known as the diaspora, people who are abroad, but uh, the very big differences of why do you not come back and why do you come back? So for example, uh, initiatives from the countries to bring back the scientists from abroad uh, and other things that are not even scientifically related on why some people don't want to come back. For example, gender violence. So all this has been coming out in these in these different stories. The other thing is uh, knowing of a lot of different things that scientists have been doing, and that's how I found out about uh, Latin America bioimaging, about Cicada, about Zenavio, lithium in Chile, uh, the great support that CZI has been given in the in the region. And uh, I, I added here the the little drawing from Hernan Greco's uh, book. So other other types of scientific communication that scientists in the region have been doing. So here you can see some of them highlighted, uh, but of course there have been many that have been mentioned. So I think also being aware that in the region, what is going on, I think is very important. Um, the other thing is for anyone considering working abroad and also what we can contribute to uh, diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives elsewhere. So I might not be a minority here in this room, but I have been a minority elsewhere. So some of the questions I ask is, uh, what are, have been your challenges as a Latin American researcher working abroad? And I think we can also contribute this to, to our colleagues abroad who, who I, I think have been very keen to, to take action to, to remove some of the barriers that exist. Um, the other is on gender balance. This is one of the questions I, I asked. And I think, again, this is important one for um, to identify initiatives that are already being done in the region and what are the challenges for those initiatives to promote network between men and women. And so something I don't know if you have noticed, but something that has been characterizing the focal plane interviews is that there's always a balance. So if I do 14 interviews, seven are women and seven are men. There's also a balance in a lot of things. I'm trying to, to keep it that way that there are some people from from a core career or from or who are technicians or, or heads of facility some who are phd students some who are postdocs some who are group leaders so to really give a voice to and and, and highlight the work that is being done and how important it is um and then of course again what are what are our expectations for the future so uh, i asked this question of uh, what is an important piece of advice you would give to younger scientists in your country and where do you see the future of science in your country and how do you expect to contribute to it? And I think this has been one of the most enriching um, questions and discussions we have had. So that's more or less uh, the interviews, but I think together we can continue to work to in this sense of, of outreach and, and networking. And I think it has a lot of, of advantages. And I have been very inspired listening to your stories and I'm very grateful for the time that you give, the, for the ones that I've already interviewed, you know, it's. Just, something between one and a half hours or two, it can extend in this range. So it's always very, I'm very grateful for your time. And uh, and yeah, so the goal is to be able to 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 link uh, what, what we've been doing in focal plane with Latin American bioimaging. In, for example, I have been told by some colleagues like, oh, this should also be available in the region, in the languages of the region. So actually all the interviews or most of them have been conducted in the original language and what appears in focal plane is a translation. So we have spoken about putting the original language interviews in a similar um, website from Latin America by imaging. We have, you know, we, in the end we will have thousands of hours of recordings. So this will, this is very, very important material, I think for our community. And the other thing I wanted to say is there are other things. So I've, I've, I recently joined the uh, eLife um, career advisory group, early career advisory group, where they are asking really for, for or they wanted to keep representation. 
and they're asking what can we do in terms of um, of equity what do we want so just to say how um, it's a question how this can be incorporated to the goals of latin america bioimaging and with this i want to thank uh, again the organizer latin america bioimaging czi for the grant to be here and then well these are names of all the participants so far I have interviewed in, in italics are the ones that have agreed to be interviewed, but have, we haven't reached that point yet. And to you for your attention. And so now, yeah, we will start with some stories from, from, from some of you. So Mariana uh, will coordinate the session with me. Uh, so now we move to other um, speakers and one thing that we we thought when we organized these uh, sessions that we are missing uh, a bit of the the bioimaging related to animals we are too much focused on microscopy and and to to go over this this gap we invited uh, Diego Supak uh, from the Department of Neurobiology uh, from the University of uh, Pittsburgh and Diego worked, uh, he's a Brazilian, so it's an example of uh, some work done uh, uh, in Brazil and, and abroad. So Diego, please. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I would like to thank Kildare, Andres, and everybody uh, that's in the organization of the first lab I'm meeting. I'm very thankful to be here. And uh, I, I always put this, this title because I think it's a little bit uh, provocative, The Secret Pathways of the Brain. And I love this cartoon whenever I'm presenting it because I work with the corpus callosum, which is this medial structure that connects the brain. But I think it translates to something more. And over here, we can think about connecting people and connecting centers as well. As Kildare said, this was uh, work done by many hands in many institutions. We have Senabi from, from Brazil, we have University of Pittsburgh from Pittsburgh, uh, NIH from, from uh, Bethesda, we have UFRJ as a whole from Rio and IDOR Institute from Rio as well. And since this is to talk about my trajectory, I would like to go back a little bit, uh, to back a little bit to my PhD, where I did it in the Center for Health Sciences in UFRJ. And I was very lucky to find these two advisors of Fernanda Mal and Roberto Lynch which were working with Kildare and the Senabio in uh, small rodent uh, MRIs. And there uh, I've met amazing people and I was able to do some science that I'm really proud of, where we image all these so many mice that have the callosal dysgenesis pointed out by the arrows, but I'm not going to focus so much on that. And we were we're doing MRI in small animals, uh, living animals, in Brazil, which was something quite new to us. And at a, some point we reach out uh, some technical difficulties and some limitations itself with the magnet because it was uh, purchased by for, for this company called Varian, which went out of business while we were receiving the magnet. And there was a whole lot of uh, confusion around this. But then another opportunity came. Um, Fernando was in touch with Afonso Silva from NIH. He's also a Brazilian that has been there for, since, well, since ever. And there they had these, uh, these other MRI techniques. They would do uh, also awake marmoset imaging, which is this monkey here that stays comfortably and nicely and happily in a helmet while he's being scanned and doing tasks. So I, I told Afonso about it uh, on a project. He said, well, if you want, we can scan these animals for you. And I was like, sure, that, 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 that would be amazing. And then some time passed, nothing really happened. Uh, he was very busy among other things. So I said, like, well, if you guys are liking people to do it, I, I would be happy to go. I had no idea about protocols or things in general. I thought I could just get, go there, do some experiments, go back to Brazil like a week or something like that. And then he was like, that, that's completely impossible. That's not an organized way to do it. Come here for a year. And I did. And I, I honestly fell in love with the work there. Um, possibilities are uh, endless. And, and I stay there for a year as a pre-doc, then another year as a post-doc. And then we, we did these uh, experiments where we did a tractography 
which is this nice MRI technique where you can color code the bundles, you can follow through the white matter fibers of the brain and produces these nice images. And through that, we can see how brain wires and how brain wires differently in animals that have corpus callosum versus no corpus callosum, which was interesting to us. But I think the most interesting thing was when we did AAV injections and we found out that all these bundles that we thought were abnormal in this um, specific mouse strain were actually present in regular mice as well. And then we were like, well, guess we don't know anything about the brain. We need to study it even further. And that's why we call this the secret pathways of the brain, because we are since then discovering new things. And in 2019, it was, uh, as Afonso said, he dropped a bomb on me. He told me and one day that, well, we're doing all the, these experiments. Next day, he told me, well, we're moving to Pittsburgh. Want to come? And it was such a major life decision of changing places again and restarting everything again. I was very lucky that I have a, a, a girlfriend that was like, sure, let's go. So we went. And there, I met even more amazing people. And we have been doing a lot of work in imaging, uh, doing uh, mainly focus on the marmosets, on these monkeys, but also doing mice. We do uh, two photon uh, imaging for calcium indicators now. We do PET CT, we do MRI, we do uh, histology. We do not do uh, correlation imaging that I learned yesterday and I think is amazing. I do want to start that now, which just shows how it's good to see other perspectives and other uh, investigators here. And well, I just wanted to add one more thing that like being here and meeting all of you and learning about what everybody does here in Latin America and abroad and all the centers, I, I see an amazing richness in this. And not only in getting to know each other, but we have now the power to organize it and think of science as something that we can do multi-centric, of course, but in reaction, for instance, let's say that the next uh, COVID happens or something like that, we do have all the techniques and all the people and all the most qualified personnel here in Latin America to deal with this. And it, I'm not sure, I, I imagine that yeah, I will be here for the, the GBI and I'll find out that other places in the world can do this as well. I learned about Africa as well, having such a, a wonderful bioimaging program, but we can do everything of this together. And we have the tools in our hands to actually do the difference in the world with this. So I'm just amazed to be here and thank you so much for having me. So next in, uh, among our speakers will be Lucia Lopez, who is from CONICET and will tell us a bit about herself and uh, probably her work on super resolution. So hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the organizers for this beautiful event. So uh, as Mariana told, I'm from Argentina, but I'm not gonna talk about my work on super resolution because we have a nice plenary talk in a few hours from Fernando Stefani, uh, who's the director of my group. So I'm gonna talk about my career path or, and my personal life as uh, these last 10 years. So that's me working on the lab, uh, on our, our microscopes. So how did this begin? How did I get into microscopy and science, I think? So I did my uh, bachelor degree and my master's thesis at the University of Buenos Aires. I studied physics uh, and as a physicist, I'm supposed to know a lot about optics, but it wasn't, till my PhD that I learned about microscopy. <laughs> so uh, during my career, I met uh, Silvina Ponce Dawson and I decided to do my PhD with her on, in physics and more specifically in biophysics. I did a lot of calcium imaging, uh, confocal microscopy, correlation, FCS, uh, correlation imaging, and also a lot of modeling and simulation. Since I'm a physicist, that's what People ex expected me to do in the area, not <laughs> experiments, but modeling. So I did a little bit of both. And at the end of my PhD, as you can see in that picture, I got pregnant. That's me doing my last experiments in the confocal microscope. Uh, it wasn't very comfortable, but I, I was happy. I was my smiling. And I was supposed to finish my PhD by 2016, but then my daughter was born and I wasn't sure what to do. I had like a, what they call a career gap. 
uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to start writing my thesis with my baby. It would be easy. It wasn't easy. <laughs> and then I, I wasn't sure what to do. Uh, everybody around me was going abroad. That's what the, the predefined career path, at least in Argentina, and I think that in other Latin American countries too, you do your PhD. And if you want to be successful or a scientist, you have to go abroad to the US or to Europe. That's what you're supposed to do. You have to find a postdoc or two postdocs or three postdocs abroad and then come back as an established scientist. So I wasn't sure that I wanted to do that. That's why from 2016 to 2018, I was kind of in a yeah a career gap. But then in 2018, I defended my thesis. That's the last photo. That's my daughter. And there's Leah, who was one of my PhD juries. And in 2017, what motivated me to finally get my thesis was that I met uh, Fernando Stefani and I decided to do a postdoc with him. So since 2018, I've been working in the Applied Nanophysics group at Sibion. That's a very nice institute in Buenos Aires. You can see in the photo. And I started my postdoc there with Fernando, mostly working on simulations and image analysis for our newest development in the lab that was our uh, MinFlux setup. I don't know if you know about that. Fernando is going to talk a lot about all of the super resolution techniques that we developed in the lab. Uh, so I started my postdoc mostly working on software development, but also helping building the setup. Uh, for most of you, maybe that's not what a microscope look la looks like, but for me, that that's how our microscopes look like, a collection of lenses and mirrors and cameras and detectors. So I help build that. Uh, I also teach for, I have been teaching for the last 10 years. That's a picture of me showing some students the lab and all the super resolution te techniques. So then came uh, 2020. I was like in the middle of, of the postdoc. Uh, and okay, so that, that's what that setup looked like when, when I finished my postdoc, but other things happened while the main flex setup was getting done. So I had another kid in 2019. So when I came back from my, my, my maternity leave on 2020, I was ready to continue with my postdoc and finish my projects and write my papers. And then the pandemic came. So in Argentina, uh, we had a very strict lockdown for a lot of months. So I was forced to stay at home. I had two little kids. My husband was a physician working in a public hospital every day. So I couldn't work. So we had periodic meetings. That's the whole group. That's Fernando. You're going to see him in a little while. And it was a very challenging year. You could say that it was another career gap for me. Because at home with two small kids, you can imagine that I couldn't work more. I could teach. I, I could participate in meetings like this with one baby in one arm and another kid in another. But I couldn't produce. I couldn't write. And it was kind of frustrating because my colleagues, the other postdocs, uh, really took advantage of that year at home. And they write a lot of papers and they advance. And they find and they found other postdocs and they went abroad after that. So after 2020, I wondered again, what do I do? How does my career continue? And then there was an opportunity in the lab for a permanent position uh, as kind of a senior postdoc or lab manager. And I took that opportunity because I saw it as a way to continue working with Fernando and with the group and continue doing uh, science there. So since 2021, we've been back in the lab. I've been lab manager, so I continue working in all the super resolution projects. I also advise PhD students and younger students. And I can say that I'm, I'm very happy with the decision I made, but I don't know. Uh, as Mariana was showing the questions, what's next? What's in the future? I don't know. I like where I am now, but I'm aware that I'm, I, I don't have like a conventional career path. And 
I sometimes get questions like, but do you want to be a technician? Do you want to be a scientist? What are you? Are you like an eternal postdoc? I don't know, but I would like to think that not everything is in such rigid boxes. And if I can still do science and participate in the project, I would be very happy. My, my everyday work, since we're not a, a core facility, I don't do services. I am directly involved in, in uh, developing the new setups, the new software. So that's why I really like where I am now, but I'm aware that it's not like a conventional uh, position in science and a conventional career path. Maybe that's what I wanted to tell you today, inspired by Claire, what she said yesterday, you do not have to take the conventional path it's hard because you encounter a lot of people that wonder, but why didn't you go abroad? Why aren't you doing another postdoc? Why don't you want to be successful? Uh, why don't you want to have your own lab? Don't you want to be a PI? I don't know. I don't have the answer to those questions, but I'm really happy where I am now. And I hope to continue working with Fernando, developing microscopes, uh, software analysis, working with people, helping other people. I really like helping other people uh, design their experiments, analyze their data. I think that that also contributes a lot to science. And okay, so to finish, I wanted to show you our group. We have a very nice group, interdisciplinary group, chemists, engineers, biologists, physics, uh, we're all needed to do what we're doing. And okay, so I, I didn't talk about my everyday work, but it looks like this. I spend a lot of time aligning our microscopes. Uh, that's me with Fernando. Uh, that's, these are one of our microscopes. I spend a lot, of, a lot of time here, but I also spend a lot of time in the computer, developing software, analyzing data. I also spend a lot of time in the lab, preparing the samples. So that's also another thing that I like about, about my job, that I can acquire a different set of skills and I'm, I'm, I continue learning. Uh, I, I like that I, I still don't have everything figured out. Okay, so thank you for your attention and I hope to have questions then. And later on, yes, Fernando is going to tell you about our work in super resolution and more specifically in septen nanometer resolution. So thank you. Thank you, Lucia. I, I must say that I'm, I was touched by your, your uh, talk. And, and I bet that you are a wonderful Lego player with your children. So uh, now we have to, two more speakers there uh, uh, that will present their um, talk remotely. So uh, first, I uh, would like to welcome Pablo Loza Alvarez from Instituto de Ciencias Fotonicas, Barcelona. Alvaro, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me well? Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers, in particular to Andres Camait, to giving me the opportunity to present uh, my trajectory. Uh, I was also asked to, pre to present a little bit of my work and I give a little perspective of why these sort of initiatives are important to the imaging scientists. Okay, um, well, my group is called the Super Resolution Light Microscopy and Anoscopy Lab. And what does that mean is that we do microscopy and all sorts of microscopy from super resolution to the mesoscopic level. Mm -hmm. We are based at ICFO in Barcelona. Okay, a little bit of my ground. Uh, I am Mexican. I did my PhD, sorry, my first degree at the National University of Mexico in 1992 as a physicist. Then I moved to the north of Mexico, to Cicese, where I did my master's degree and I specialized in optics and a little bit on ultra short pulses. Then I moved to St. Andrews in Scotland, where I did my, my PhD. And in there I worked with ultra short pulses and nonlinear optics. This means that uh, I was using uh, nonlinear crystals, and we use those nonlinear crystals for, for characterizing ultra short pulses. After my PhD, I moved to, uh, to ICFO in Barcelona, huh? and then I, uh, I decided to start using ultra short pulses for some biomedical applications. And the natural way to do that was uh, through nonlinear microscopy. 
So we started then uh, exchanging nonlinear crystals for samples, for, for, uh, from biological samples. And then I, had, I constructed there several microscopes, some multiphoton, I combined with confocal, I did some uh, microscopes in Raman. And by 2009, we had a good collection of microscopes and people were coming more and more to, uh, to use them. So we decided to launch the, the facility, the Super Resolution Light Microscopy Facility or SLA. And then by that time, uh, well, uh, we did uh, uh, adapt confocal microscopes to work in the, the nonlinear regime. We may perform uh, third harmonic generation microscopes dedicated only to that or to second harmonic and so on. To learn a little bit more about my trajectory, uh, I, as a microscopist, let me just explain that my first biological sample was uh, starch from potatoes. And this is great because starch produces uh, an excellent second harmonic signal from which we can optimize pulses. And our first work was to optimize pulses at the sample plane of a nonlinear microscope. From there, uh, we combined nonlinear microscopy with fluorescence, and then we started to use many uh, animal models like flies, worms, and so on. And we were uh, working on muscular growth restriction, dystrophy, ischemia, and many other uh, applications. After that, there was the time of light sheet. Light sheet uh, started to, to be famous uh -huh. and uh, because we could build microscopes. At that time, there were no commercial houses. So we started, started to build light sheet microscopes. And we put many, many different samples, spheroides, organoids, uh, uh, embryos from several fish and so on. And we studied different things like the cancer, development, malformations, and so on. Uh, more or less at the same time, super resolution techniques became av available. Uh -huh. And then we acquired a few of those microscopes, one stead microscope, one store uh, system. And then we started to study different things. For example, Alzheimer's plates, as you can see in this, uh, this image. And soon after that, uh, and more recently, we are working with the system that is called Adaptive Optics, a scanning laser ophthalmoscope, and this is uh, for looking at retinas in human patients. And the work that we are doing at the moment is we're combining with OCT, and probably in the future, we will be combining uh, AOSLO with uh, nonlinear uh, microscopy, probably to see fluorescence from retinas in, uh, in animals, not in humans, but, but in animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this type of work, I have been working with many different samples uh, from uh, HIV, excess uh, retinas, in vivo retinas in patients, and so on. Uh, today, my, my lab is like this. Uh -huh. uh, I have a few systems, uh, more or less 11 systems. And uh, more, some of them are just uh, commercial systems, some of them are system that I have modified through the time, and some systems are totally built from scratch. Uh -huh. One, probably one common thing to all of them is that uh, they all offer uh, characteristics or uh, some specificities that are not counted or encountered in commercial systems. For example, we have a confocal microscope that we have been modified to work in spectral uh, domain with two photons, second harmonic, third harmonic, with adaptive optics, we can do photo manipulation. We have built four light sheet fluorescence microscopes. They are combined with uh, linear and nonlinear techniques, light sheet combined with Raman. We have used, the, used them for high throughput or, or for fast volumetric imaging and so on. Raman microscopy, uh, this system is not modified in the hardware, but we have people that know very well how to analyze the complicated spectra that is coming from this uh, from the, from the biological samples. And then we can give uh, some interesting interpretation. We have a storm system, we have uh, the capability to use EMCCDs, SMOS, to spark or sensitive uh, imaging. We can change the field of view. We have a STED and pulse uh, system, STED CW and pulse system. Uh -huh. uh, in this, we have tested new novel laser sources, novel algorithms, and more recently, we have upgraded the system to work with uh, the fluorescence lifetime imaging technique. And our new toy that is uh, probably one month old is the infinity state system from uh, from a very mm -hmm. uh, on the on the bottom you can see some numbers uh, we are around uh, 10 research we have been 10 researchers like uh, in the next in the, in the last uh, uh, eight years more or less uh, we are a facility but we also ask for projects 
and we publish papers. And uh, for example, our facility is used more or less uh, eight to 9,000 hours uh, per year. My team is a highly multidisciplinary team. Uh, this is composed of people that work in engineering, chemistry, biology, physics, image data processing. And the emphasis of my lab is basically to do research and development uh -huh, by adapting new technologies, developing novel instrumentation, or combining different uh, types of imaging techniques in one single system. Of course, what we want is to attract this biological user that has a specific need that cannot be satisfied or cannot be tackled in conventional microscope uh, commercial systems. Uh -huh. uh, we do that by improving specs, uh, giving unique features, or by producing custom-made systems from scratch. And of course, uh, we also like to uh, train people. We want to train people to the latest technologies, and we would like to work with people with different backgrounds, new generation of, uh, of researchers, and we can tailor uh, courses according to the background of the people. And as I was telling you, our mission is to provide solutions to unmet biomedical needs in microscopy. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a little bit more of the same. We have these three pilots, research and development. Uh, we do this so that we can attract a special uh, uh, biomedical researchers with a specific need. Uh -huh. And of course, we like to train people with the latest technologies. And my, my activity runs uh, around these three uh, axes. Other things, uh, in terms of Europe, uh, we belong to several uh, research infrastructures. For example, uh, we have been selected uh, nodes in Eurobio Imaging in the first call for nodes in 2013. Now, uh, Spain is not a full member of Eurobio Imaging, but we are working really hard with the ministry and with uh, Eurobio Imaging to finalize the agreement so that we can uh, finally uh, be a full member of Eurobio Imaging. Hopefully, we can do that in the next in the next months. Uh, other uh, infrastructures is the, the uh, Spanish uh, microscopy uh, network. We also are part of Laser Lab and ActFast. In terms of collaboration with industry, uh, we work very closely with uh, Nikon uh, in the storm techniques. We look, we, we work very closely with Leica, also uh, in this case in step microscopy techniques. And we also work very closely with other companies like Fila producing lasers. We test their, their lasers in our microscope systems. And we uh, work a lot uh, very closely with Hamamatsu by testing the, the new cameras, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, one of the things that we would like to do by uh, these collaborations is to have a faster, that our research is transferred faster to the society. As well as with the industry, we have a close collaboration with uh, different biomedical institutions. Uh -huh. And we have established the Barcelona, Barcelona Medical Photonics Network. And here we work with the main uh, biomedical uh, research institutes, as well as with the main hospitals in Barcelona. One of the ways in which we establish this collaboration is, for example, through hiring a PhD or postdocs, in which these spend half of the time at ICPO and half of the time in the, in the other institution. And this creates an, a very nice synergy and catalyzes a lot uh, the work. Uh, yeah, as, as part of my work, well, I have already shown that we are active in looking at retinas. We have worked with retinal implants. We, have, we can see humans' uh, retinas. Uh, for example, here you can see the vessels, and this is the blood circulating in the vessel of, of the retinas. Obviously, the, eyes, the eye is moving. And uh, finally, we have built uh, another system that is ready for use in the different hospitals. We have one system in... in Norway and one system in, in Paris, and they are testing these systems uh, for uh, medical use. Uh, this is another part, big part of our work. We like to combine techniques, and in this case, this, is, this was an EUB Corbel project uh, a few years ago. And here we were using, we were studying the ray fish and we were studying the cartilage zones of the ray fish and we were, for that we were combining many different techniques as you can see here from label free to uh, clarification techniques also using mathematical models mm -hmm. uh, raman we have lots of activity in raman uh, in, raman is very 
uh, wide to use. Uh -huh. So we have used it for the food industry, for studying cancer, for radiation, and even for studying uh, some uh, archaeological samples. Light sheet fluorescence, we are very active in light sheet microscopy. I have already commented a little bit on this. Uh, one of the things that we are doing is combining light sheet uh, with fluidic systems so that we can study many, many different samples uh, uh, in a very fast way. Light sheet is very, uh, very good for li uh, imaging living samples. So that's why we want to study many, many of them. And of course, uh, in terms of super resolution, we have a step, but we, have, we also have a storm, and we have this uh, private collaboration in which we are ex, uh, studying encephalopathy uh, uh, from uh, new, uh, cultures taken from uh, patients. And my perspective of how LAVI can be useful network for the Latin American scientists, well, I don't know what to say. Really, uh, I think I share what uh, you have already. Uh, Put into the web. Uh -huh. So probably this is my vision that as a community, an imaging scientist can benefit on the know-how and resources that uh, all the community has. Uh, of course, it's a strong way for collaborate, for, for collaborative efforts and uh, yeah, for difficult problems and enhanced uh, capacities probably could solve uh, in an efficient way all the problems. Uh, as an individual for the imaging scientists, I, I think, I guess, uh, this is a great tool for professional development to learn the best common practices between uh, imaging scientists and, of course, uh, an excellent way to train uh, and shall win opportunities. And, of course, needless to say that uh, at the SLN here, we are very happy to actively participate and learn from you, but also to contribute in whatever we could uh, so to make this Latin America bioimaging uh, stronger. And with that, I would like to thank you. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. And now, uh, as our last speaker is Moara Lemos. Uh, Moara and I coincided in several parts of our careers, and she's she's an expert in electron microscopy. She was a mentee of uh, Hilary, and so she will tell us a bit about her. Hello, everyone. Let's. So thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here today. So today I'm here in Portugal. I just moved from uh, uh, Paris to Portugal. And now I am uh, in charge of the EM service in here. And well, uh, I, I'm glad to, to share about my career path because it's a kind of miscellaneous, a little bit of what Lucia said, a little bit of what Diego said. And I'm coming, I'm Brazilian, I'm a biologist. I'm coming from the countryside of Brazil. Uh, my history of doing bioimaging, it started uh, almost during my bachelor, but I just use it like optical microscopy, doing some bright field. And I always study some parasites or as there was sometimes I was uh, studying some plants and I was doing some characterization. But the most part of uh, I want to share with you, it's back on 2015 when I did my master in Juiz de Fora in the characterization of some parasites. But then I moved to uh, Rio to do my PhD on the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where I described a cell cycle of a new species of a trypanosomes. And for that, I used quite a lot of optical microscopy describing the uh, uh, bloodstream forms that exists on the fishes. And then I used quite a lot of electron microscopy to describe the morphotypes uh, that lived in the leeches that transmit those parasites to the fish during the blood meal. Then it was quite interesting. I described this new species, Trypanosoma belli, which I gave the name of my father because he inspired me a lot of being uh, curious, uh, curious to about different things. And I keep studying this parasite, but I started a postdoc and uh, where I was, I wanted to look for more exotic parasites. And then I studied uh, frog trypanosomes. And then I also find interesting things. And, but there was a time I spent two years doing a postdoc in the Taisot Padron lab. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a good idea to change a little bit of the field. 
to see different things. And then I went to my second postdoc to the Brazilian Center for Physics Research, where I integrate a small group of biologists that uh, worked with uh, biomaterials and nanoparticles. And then I was interested to study the interaction of the mammalian cells of, with different uh, biocompatible material. In this case, it's the interaction of the cells with the hydroxyapatite, with different types of hydroxyapatite. And then I use it quite a lot, electron microscopy techniques. I'm showing you here the SEM techniques, but I did quite a lot of uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy. We also use the SEM for, uh, that was quite interesting because we discovered that some sponge pickles has specific patterns related to the species. So we described these patterns, identify the relating the species with the patterns, and we realized that was a, a great tool for the taxonomy to help in the uh, identification of the sponges, which are quite of complicated, uh, have quite of complicated taxonomy. Then in that institute, I spent one year in this postdoc where I did uh, different things. And I had the great opportunity to uh, learn about another step of uh, sample preparation. In this case, we used a dual beam instrument, the FIBSAM, which is equipped with a gallium beam and uh, an electron beam. And this is not used properly for imaging to uh, do the data collection on the samples, but to prepare the samples to go to the transmission electron microscope. So these works like uh, you have the electron beam makes uh, ablate the sample, remove the part of the sample, and then you have the electron beam to do the images and follow every step. And then you come with the nano micro manipulator and attach it from one side of your lamella. And then you glue it with platinum, with the gas injection system. And then you transfer your tiny lamella to a half grid where you're going to attach it to the wall of this uh, half grid. And then you use it, these organic metallics again to glue it in here. And this is the step that you start thinning your sample, then to have a thickness to go to the TEM to do the data acquisition. This is very common for um, uh, material science, but it's very useful for hard tissues like bones and tooth to study it in uh, biological uh, samples. And then at the end of this one year, I decided to come back to the parasitology field. I miss it quite a lot. And uh, I decided to move from Brazil to France and then to go to Institut Pasteur to start a postdoc, postdoc in the lab of Philippe Pasteur. That was quite striking because in my mind, I said, okay, I'm coming for six months. I stayed seven years. And culturally, it's quite different. So uh, I left Brazil in February in the middle of summer and I arrived in the middle of the winter. It seems not a big deal, but it is. So apart from the cultural adaptations, I had a nice time in there. And in this time, I was going for a study at uh, Trypanosoma brucei, which is a causative agent of sleeping sickness in humans. And this parasite is transmitted by the bite of, I'm sorry, by the bite of the tsetse flies. So they live in different organs of those uh, of this fly. And I was interested to study the proventriculus in the, how the flagellum was built how the second flagellum was built in this specific morphotypes in here. So to see that, I used the 3D technique using the FIBSAM, but here the FIBSAM instrument was used to acquire data, to uh, acquire a 3D volume and analyze it fully. So the technique used was a slice and view where the gallium beam was removing uh, the top surface of the block face and the electron beam was making the image. This successfully generated a volume that was reconstructed and renderized as you can see here. 
So here we can see that the proventricles is full of parasites. It's massive, occupied for the parasites. And then we can see the profile of different trypanosomes, so transversional ones and these longitudinal ones with the nucleus and the mitochondria. Behind was a specific morphotype I was interested that has the, uh, the flagellum, what I was looking for. So I did uh, different uh, kinds of imaging uh, related to the uh, fluorescence microscopy to characterize that. But then we had a more um, resolution for what I was looking for, which was the assembling of the new flagellum, analyze the, each profile of those parasites found in the proventriculus. Was more than 80 parasites analyzed, it's was quite a lot, but it was really nice because we realized that those um, flagellum, it's uh, being assembled while the parasite was uh, changing morphotypes, was going to a different developmental stage. And that was pretty new. So this we can see here, it's a, a segmentation on top of the one slice of the what you can get during the slice and view. So the new flagellum was very tiny and then grow attached to the pre-existing mature one. The nucleus was migrating while the flagellum was getting elongating. The nucleus migrate toward the posterior region where this uh, organelle, the kinetoplast that contains the mitochondrial DNA is located. So in the more advanced developmental stage, the nucleus reaches the, the kinetoplast region and the flagellum too. And but in this case, the flagellum is much more elongated. So uh, we did quite uh, different things at Philippe Pastin but I had the opportunity to get a permanent position at Institut Pasteur, and then I became a research engineer. So it was a little bit different from a postdoc position because I had to be uh, responsible for the projects, for the projects of the lab to assist the postdocs and the PhD students. I also had my own project, but I have to take care of the lab also, the functioning of the lab. And then in this, uh, uh, this lab, they were doing mostly electron microscopy, basically electron microscopy, but mostly cryo electron microscopy. And I helped them to establish the cryo correlative uh, uh, light and electron microscopy workflow. This workflow, we were the first ones to establish that on the, at Pasteur. And then for that, we use it, we grow the cells with fluorescent markers on the grid, on the EM grid. And then we plant freeze the cells. We make them uh, vitreous for us to be able to look on the microscopes. And we do the imaging of the fluorescent image, fluorescence imaging under the cryogenic conditions on the cryolite microscope. And then we transfer this grid for a transmission electron microscope and we image the same cell. And then we correlate those images. This correlation allowed us to see the fluorescent markers and to choose our uh, region of interest. And from this, we can do uh, two different things. From the uh, yellow squares, we can image those regions directly under the cryo transmission electron microscope. We were interested to do the tomography, so we tilt the, the, the sample to acquire different images. So in these uh, uh, thin regions, we can do it directly. But in the red squares, we were not able to image them. You can see on the uh, transmission electron microscopy image, these regions are too thick. So we did lamella on those uh, cells. And this now it's a little bit different because we use the cryo FIBSEM machine and these we don't remove, we don't take the lamella from the cells. We use the cells as a support for the lamella. So we choose the region that you see uh, in the correlated images. And then you come to the region of interest 
and with the, the gallium being you remove, the ion being you remove the top and the bottom part, our lamella is this yellow one, so we remove the bulk sample. Here we have a lamella to make it thin. This is the uh, cryofib SEM image. When you look at from the top, you have the SEM image. This is a lamella made in here, two different fields, depending on the, the kind of the beam you're uh, looking at. And here is this lamella on the transmission electron microscope. So we have this region here, very transparent to the electrons, and then you can do, we can acquire the tomograms. Then after the tomograms acquisition, we uh, uh, align we align the tomograms and we segment them. At that time, I was interested to uh, look to the viral particle. So this is the viral particle. It was inside a vesicle decorated with uh, a clattering. Here in orange, it is the clattering schedule. And in blue, is the virus particle. And then in the other image, this we are looking for the virus particle inside an endolysosome where I segmented it, the, its membrane in purple, the different content in gray, and the viral particle in blue. And then more recently, I have the chance to move to Portugal to work with service. So now I'm helping, uh, I'm in charge of the electron microscopy for the Institute. This is quite new for me. I'm learning a lot. I think this, the, the good part of this uh, job is that you have different kind of challenges along of your ca career path. Like Lucia said, I don't know about the future. I don't know if this is my, uh, my position that I'm going to stay for my entire life, but it's been quite uh, fun as it was in Paris, but it's a different moment. So I was looking for uh, something more, something closer to my culture because I spent almost 10 years in, in France. And then I think it was a time to move. And with that, I would like to, to thank the people that helped me uh, to do the experiments, mainly Thaisos Padron, she was my advisor in my PhD, the Sena Bio and uh, Vanderlei de Souza and Kilder that allowed me to use the microscope. So I used to say that was the Disneyland for the microscopist. We have access to the different kind of techniques and I learned a lot. And also Dorit Haineng and uh, Philippe Pastin for the opportunity they gave me and now the uh, IMM Institute. So thank you. Thank you, Moara. So I have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'd like to invite the speakers to sit over there so that we can have a little discussion. So questions or comments? Hi, thank you all for your presentations. Actually, I was very interested in your experience. You said you moved to, not, not to Pittsburgh, sorry, to the first place without any knowledge of the protocols and the, and the, uh, and actually that happened to a lot of us. I was wondering what was your, say, turning point in terms of uh, quickly getting into that uh, type of work? You know, did you go to boot camp? Do you, what, what particular experience allow you to get involved quickly into your new type of job and your new research activities? Yeah. Uh Thank you for the question. That, that's for me it was very interesting experience because uh, I didn't know how uh, regulated things were there, and not regulated in the sense of bioethics or anything like that, but regulated in the sense of uh, courses that you you need to take in to be able to be certified to do something. Something that I have been doing in Brazil for so many years. Um, so uh, I was at the NIH and they have this wonderful program to help uh, foreigners to get very quickly adapted. They have something that they call uh, an English course, but it's more like a English academia. Uh, it's more like how you write an email, how you talk to someone that, that you have just met, how you do an interview, how you, you talk to the director of your department, things like that, which might sound a little silly, but it's, incredibly different from country to country. And I think that was a lifesaver for me. In the everyday activity, I, I had a, a very welcoming lab. So they helped me a lot in getting up to date. And I had a very different courses that go from microsurgery up to MRI safety. So it was a, a, a program that was very 
uh, enthusiastic about having people there. It was a, the, these courses were established courses or were, let's say, provided informally by lab members? No, they were established courses uh, throughout the institution. Thanks a lot. So, uh, for Lucia. Lucia, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've never seen a man saying the same that you mentioned here. So, uh, how can you see uh, the scientific environment can be more friendly to women? What's your opinion? Uh, it's a very interesting question. I think a lot about that uh, since I became aware of a lot of biases that I wasn't aware before. I think that the first thing is talk to people, get to know them and get to know their specific, I don't know, life environment. You cannot assume that everybody has the same privileges or the same opportunities. Uh, I was lucky to work with people that were very empathic, like Silvina and Fernando, and they gave me a lot of opportunities, but it's not like that everywhere. You don't have to assume that we all come from the same place and that we have the same opportunities and I think that like in every um, environment it's mostly dominated by men and especially in like uh, power places and they always tell you you have to speak up you have to speak like a man speak up no we're women we speak like we speak and they're always asking us you have to adapt to a man's world we have to stop asking that uh, to women and just acknowledge that we're different and we also deserve to be heard and understood. We don't have to behave like men to be treated like equally. So I would say like talk to people, get to know them and don't assume that we're all the same. That would be my advice. And Mariana, if you're... Uh your experience with the focus plan, with these interviews. Uh, it's possible you talk about more about the motivations for younger students or science to become microscopists and... Um, you mean what motive? So the, the ones that are already microscopists? The, the motivations. Sorry? The motivations. The motivations. Yes, that's one of the questions that uh, that I've asked, and and some come from early childhood, saying, you know, my I don't know. One very touching story was uh, Flavio Solesis, who's from Uruguay, a uh, story of how he got into microscopy, how he was given a a box with slides from his his father, and and from there he took it on. Others, it has come later on, so they're interested in science, and then some by serendipity came to, to microscopy, others was very focused and they knew this is what they wanted to do. I think this is, this is covered in a way. And I think it's a, it's a good um, example for... I don't know. Hi, yeah, I'd just like to thank all the speakers for their very interesting perspectives and um, different viewpoints, different career stages represented. Very interesting. I'd, I'd like to Particularly thank uh, Mariana for taking an interest and and taking um, making the effort uh, to place Latin American imaging in the spotlight. I think it's um, visibility is something we all we all struggle for. It's a crowded crowded world. Crowded. There's a lot of information bombarding from all sides, and it's it's difficult to find a space. It's difficult to find a niche. I agree. There's astonishingly wonderful work going on in Latin America that that doesn't. I, I don't think always gets the recognition it, it deserves, um, and it's it's so it's just part of modern science practice. We, we you know, social media. Anyone who's made an attempt to, and some people do it very well, and some people do. It's it's incredibly time consuming, and um, it it can be hard still to 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 be in that space. Um, it's an art. It's a skill. Um, not everybody. Has this, has the skill or the or the motivation to do it? I think it's very important that we do engage because it's uh, although it can feel very much like sort of self promotion, and these are not sort of the, uh, um, things that we're as scientists necessarily sort of conditioned to 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 feel comfortable with. But um, it's it's important because although you may be promoting your own paper, your own lab, your own achievements, 
uh, but at the end of the day, they're, they're coming from Brazil or Argentina or Chile, and we all benefit because we all benefit from that visibility, even if it, it, it can feel uncomfortable at times. It's not a natural space for scientists to occupy uh, a lot of the time. So um, I think it's it's such a critical part of uh, modern communication. And I, I do think we should uh, maybe look to, I'm thinking in terms of uh, things that Laddie can, can do or, or, or help with. Um, maybe some sort of social media training initiatives or social media um or, or communication initiatives that's what we've, we've, we've been talking about today i think i think this is such an important area these days and, and uh, it, it's not natural for, for a lot of people so uh thank you for for putting us in in, in that spotlight and um yeah hopefully uh it's a very ambitious five year five year sort of program to go through and that's such a huge geographical area but it's uh, it's very very worthwhile so so thank you and thank you to all the speakers it's uh, it's great to see such such great efforts happening so, thanks thank you um i mean for me it's really i thank all of you for for the time you dedicate to it i know everybody's very busy so yes and and everybody that facilitates also the names of other colleagues so sometimes it's very hard um i right now was in one specific country trying to find and while some web pages, which is something that was touched upon yesterday, some web pages make it easy that you say advanced biomedicine. And get a list of I um, wanted to make more of a comment um, for uh, Lucia's uh, situation. Something that I've noticed in my own um, uh, staff as well is just the titles and the language we use. So I think you said you're a lab manager. And I was thinking when you were talking like that probably doesn't describe what you do at all. And um, and I think maybe that's something as an international community we can think about, like, are there ways we can give different titles that are more appropriate that would really represent um, what you do? And and I'm not someone who's like, oh, my title's this or that, but it, it makes such a difference in your institution and with your um, the people around you. And I have an example where one of my staff, I most of my staff are postdocs, even though they're not doing a postdoc style position that's their career stage, but that's the only HR position that fits. We don't have proper HR positions. So one of my postdocs was leaving for maternity leave and she was really taking a leadership role and I was so impressed. And uh, we decided to promote her to assistant director of training and education. And it was really interesting when we were going through it, I was thinking, well, she's going on maternity leave. Like I, I shouldn't promote her right before she leaves. And then I'm like, oh my God, of course I should promote her before she leaves, right? And you get into this mentality of, you know, the culture that's around us. And so we did about a month before um, she went on maternity leave, we promoted her and we did a little announcement. And then that year our, our facility was being um, reviewed and the committee asked why the assistant director was not a professor, like a, a PI lab. And I actually didn't say anything, like I didn't rebut uh, I'm thinking just now that I should go back to them and say, yeah, she should be. When are you promoting her, you know? Because they're thinking it should be somebody else, but there's no way a starting professor or an established professor would be able to do what she does. You know, they don't have the time, they don't have the expertise. And so uh, I think maybe I should go back to the committee and talk to them about that. But so just a comment more of how we could maybe improve. First of all, it was a very, very inspiring session. And uh, I wanted to second the priest and also thank Mariana for all the work that you've put in it. Uh, I, was, I thought that I was up to date with all the articles. I was really trying to read them all, but seeing the list there, I feel that I have some work, work to do. Uh, what I wanted to ask, um, there are so many stories, different stories, different struggles. And right now where you are, do you feel recognized? And do you feel that you have uh, still space and support to grow further. Thanks for the question. Right now, I really feel recognized, but because I'm with Fernando, not by, I don't think by the institution, but by the person that I'm working with, because he gives me space and opportunities and, and freedom. But I don't think that that's very common for people that do jobs like mine to be recognized. Yeah. Yeah. And it has to do with what? Claire said, uh, I have a, like a title that doesn't relate with what I do in my everyday work, 
Uh, I'm considered a technician, but I'm advising PhD students. So yeah, I don't think that we often get recognized. Yeah. What's the solution? I don't know. Well, I, I feel there's a, so for example, right now I'm, I'm considering what, what path to follow. And, you know, I was inspired by some of the stories of uh, people who took hybrid positions of uh, being at a core facility and doing research at the same time. But sometimes I feel there's this trend to think that if you don't continue in the, in the, you know, conventional academic path, if you're not going to be a PI, and I say, I would like to work at a core facility. I have been told like, but why would you move to a core facility if you could be a PI? It's seen as a failure in the career, which I feel is not, but you feel this pressure or this judgment, or at least I feel it. Um, in terms of female in my career, I feel, uh, I feel sometimes it's, 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 yeah, there's still some people that think pretty really pictures but it's a lot of knowledge that has to go into that. So I see the, the work of, you know, so many people here, which I feel in other fields, sometimes not know what goes into getting the pretty picture. And I think it's the same. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you also for your beautiful talks. Very, very nice. Um, so, sort of an idea of, often solution, but because these situations are very well known in, in, in many labs, no? Uh, but but we always apply for grants, no? New grants every three years, I don't know, two years, five years. So every grant also gives space to like redefine positions, no? And to say, okay, what would I like to be and how would I like to be called? I mean, they're not completely free, but there are always these spaces also which come up and we try in the lab at least is to take these moments and to say, okay, now it's the time that you can come in into the next round and then give yourself a title. Think think about your title. What do you want to do? What responsibilities would you like to take? Uh, and, and 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 just in your your positions and just yeah, form form your form your matrix. No, not not always works, but uh, sometimes yes, it works and gives solution and gives confidence also and stability and a nice work life balance or whatever. Just a comment, maybe. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. So with that, we thank uh, all the speakers and the audience.